um, properly afraid of me. Um, but the, the real truth is that it's not really a hackers conference. It's it it should it's more uh, appropriately a, an IT security or an IT tech conference, and it's actually. Um, two conferences in one, because there's a lot of uh, uh, tech conferences. It starts with trainings, and um, there are three of these conferences that are held globally. Um, we just did the one in, uh, well, it, earlier in the spring we were in Singapore in March, because of course, why wouldn't you be in Singapore in March? Um, the Black Hat USA event is in Vegas in July. Again, of course, because what better time to be in Las Vegas than in uh, the midst of, of 113 degree weather, um, 55 degree weather if you if you speak Celsius. Um, and then the third event of the year it will be in um, in London this year for EMEA, and uh, and of course that will be in in December. So we just so you know the Black Hat uh, planners uh, take weather into account, of course. But the first, so for, for all of these events, the first uh, two to four days, it uh, involves uh, just training sessions. And then the second, uh, the second part of the show is um, briefing sessions and then, of course, the business hall. And from a, an engineer's point of view in terms of supporting a, a network, these are very different um, events. And so the, the traffic types and the traffic amounts um, vary widely. But first, let's talk about who. So I, I said it's not really a hackers event, but this is the cliche, of course, that all of the attendees are evil and, and young. Um, the young part is correct, and they get younger, at least for me, every year. And so rather than the, the Mr. Robot cliche, the, the hacker in the, in the black hoodie, it really just looks like, to me, a bunch of kids. But that's also a cliche. Um, when you look around the events, and I chose this picture because I just really want to know what the guy in the glasses, or both of the guys in the glasses are looking at, because they neither, both of them look either um, properly concerned or um, stunned at, at whatever is being discussed in this briefings. Um, but also, it's this. And I like this, uh, and I just pulled these randomly from the black hat photos from the, just this year's uh, event in the U.S. Uh, this one at least shows a, a couple of women in the uh, in the audience. And while we're not uh, appropriately represented, we are uh, we're getting stronger. In fact, there were three uh, women in the black hat knock in Singapore this year, um, and that was really nice. And in, in the U.S. one as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how many of us make it into the uh, London event. I know Ruckus is taking two. Um, to London, um, but more than um, than it, the fact that they don't meet the cliches, um, it, it, certainly the Black Hat USA event, which is just we've just come um, finished with, is um, and it is the largest event. It's represented by more than a hundred countries, um, and and so people come from all over the world. In fact, this year uh, the attendees uh, uh, re, uh, exceeded more than. 18,000 um, people. But aside from the fact that we've got people coming from over 100 countries, at least to the US one, and, and they're coming from all over the world for the other two events as well, the people who attend um, are basically anyone who cares about security. And it's a lot more people than, 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 me, than you would think at first blush. Um, and so I, I created this graphic just well, one, because it was cool, but also because I got to use some of my favorite uh, favorite bywords. Of course, uh, Petya, not Petya, um, just this year, and Stuxnet um, in the last couple of years have been huge. We've gone from well, worrying about malware to the new uh, phrase, uh, the wipers, which was what we saw with uh, with not Petya, but also hidden here in, the, in, in my little uh, black hat graphic. Um, I have Swift on security. So if any of you guys are active on Twitter and at all in, interested in uh, InfoSec going forward, um, she, her, and I call her she, her, her avatar is Taylor Swift, and she is probably one of the single smartest people um, in, in the InfoSec side. So if you're, if you're at all interested uh, in, in uh, following any of this or just getting at the uh, speed, um, I, I do uh, encourage you to follow Swift on security. But essentially, anyone who, the people who attend uh, Black Hat are anyone who cares about security, and you'd be surprised how many people that is. It's, oh, anyone in higher education. In fact, higher education may be the single most vulnerable, most targeted um, 
uh, of the vet, of the um, verticals listed here is only because um, they see, they tend to be a softer target and they have a wealth of information, um, social security numbers, ID, uh, national ID numbers, um, and, and things, and also uh, data, um, just I, in terms of intellectual property and research and things like that. Uh, but also hospitality, NDUs, K through 12, the, uh, obviously the public venues have to be concerned about it, all the way down to um, uh, the, the, uh, the federal um, um, component. So this is not just the FBI and CIA, but it's the, um, all of the other nationalities um, involved too. And the um, FBI every year has a booth at, the, uh, at Black Hat, and it is the single most crowded um, booth. Um, and so, uh, it, because j just people are interested in talking to them and, and probably interested in getting jobs. But it, so the people who are attending Black Hat are representatives of all of these verticals, and it's not a it's not a, uh, a coincidence that this is a the same list of verticals. If you go to the Ruckus uh, website, these are our key verticals. Walking through the uh, hallways, walking through the training rooms, through the sessions, through the, um, through the business hall, I ran into uh, CIOs, CEOs, um, IT directors, um, uh, InfoSec um, experts from every single one of these verticals, and they were all there to, to learn more about how to, to um, secure, it, they, they're, they're from that vertical, or they were um, customer, they were bars that service those customers. Um, and as they walk through them, um, this is what they see. They see that the signage is here everywhere. And so this is a big thing for us because you don't think of Ruckus um, when you think necessarily of, of of InfoSec or for a secure network. Do you think of uh, Ruckus when you think of the best Wi-Fi? Absolutely. Do you think of uh, Ruckus when you think of the best networking? Because now we have the ICX switches. Absolutely, but um, the idea of us being there at Black Hat is a little bit, I, I get a few head, uh, heads cocked at me and, and asking what it is and what's our story and why we're there. And that's one of the reasons that we're here. So um, this year, 18,000 people um, were uh, walking around the Mandalay Bay Convention Center and um, absolutely everywhere they went, they were seeing signs like this. So the word is getting out that we're there. In addition to uh, 18,000 people from more than 100 um, countries, there are uh, more than 300 different media outlets that are represented. And by the way, this uh, right side of the slide is not there, just uh, this is not an ego thing. This is actually there uh, to let you know that we were, uh, we were pushing the story. We uh, had a number of people come by and interview me. But the more important thing is that no matter how successful you are, um, in life, no matter um, how good you get at what you're doing, you, um, there's a reason that God gave you teenage daughters. And for me, it was so that I could send out a link to my interview and my children could say, wow, you sounded so smart, but oh my goodness, you look so old. You look just like your mother. <laughs> so um, that's, there's always a way to, to uh, you know, bring you back down to earth. Oh, um, and before I forget, I meant to tell you, I am, uh, not only am I talking to you from my, um, awesome log cabin in on the lake in East Texas, but I'm also talking to you from my office where I have multiple monitors set up. So if there are any questions, although you guys are on mute, um, if you want to put a question into the chat session, I will, I will keep an eye on that over on the other side and, um, and try to answer it on the fly. So feel free to answer, ask any questions that, you, that come up um, while we're talking. Um, I know that you guys are from Asia, and there's a cliche about you guys, too, that you don't like to ask questions, but I love to answer questions, so I'm going to challenge you to, uh, so that I get at least one question uh, at some point during this session. Um, okay, so this is the who that attends it. Um, I wanted to give you guys a look behind, and we call it the plexiglass curtain for the knock because this is actually uh, a room um, in, in the uh, convention center. So we set up this conference room and then build a, a, a uh, just to the side uh, here is a plexiglass wall that walls us off. So you can come in and see all of our display monitors and see the knock. You can see that we're, you know, it's, we do have the mood lighting going on and everything. Um, but it also means that anybody can come in and uh, talk to us, ask questions, we'll come out and, and talk to you. Um, you're free to take pictures as long as it's not, you know, high resolution. Um, but 
it, we really wanted to be it, the, the, the NOC itself and the network that we provide for Black Hat is very open and transparent. So we monitor all traffic coming and going um, through our network, and we do uh, take steps to protect the internal uh, network so all of our devices are safe. But anything that's going out is not necessary. We, we don't do anything to that. Um, for one thing, during the training sessions, you're actually maybe doing things that look hinky, but you're actually there to learn, and so it wouldn't be appropriate for us to do anything with that. But the NOC itself um, is very interesting, and I'll talk to you in, a, in a, another couple of slides about uh, our SLA and what the expectations of the quality of service are. Um, uh, but for right now, I'm just going to start with starting in 2017, this is, these are the players in, uh, in the Black Hat NOC. So at the very north end, uh, Palo Alto provides the firewall, and that's doing um, a lot of our um, uh, rate limiting um, and, and, and managing that, but it's also doing all of the firewall. Um, RSA, um, and they've purchased a company called WatchGuard, um, have been the, uh, the network monitors, and they've been involved with the Black Hat NOC um, for a while. Um, previous to 2017, so the last previous two years, Ruckus was the wireless provider for the attendees. So anything that happened there in the any Wi-Fi that was in the common areas and then in the, during all of the briefing sessions and the, the business hall, that was all ruckus. Um, previously, there was another vendor that did the, just the, the Wi-Fi um, for, um, for the training session. So it was a little bit weird. Uh, uh, in fact, it was almost a little psychotic because you had, an, uh, you had the house infrastructure Wi-Fi, then you had the other vendors trainings Wi-Fi for the first four days, they would pull theirs down, and my Wi-Fi would be in most of the areas, but then we had another, uh, at least half of the area that we had to cover um, overnight that we had to roll out. So it was a little bit of a marathon um, uh, of an event in terms of, of getting things deployed. Starting in 2017, that vendor, um, and I will not name names just because I'm, I'm Southern and so I'm polite. But the other vendor was fired from being involved with Black Hat. And so from anything south of the firewall, because RSA is just there for monitoring, but all of the network services south of the firewall are Ruckus, Ruckus branded. So all of my Wi-Fi ran across IC, Ruckus ICX switches, um, and all of the traffic was either carried on the wired or the wireless side with the, with the Ruckus access points. Um, this year I used smart zones. Um, a two in a, in, a, uh, in a cluster, so we had active active um, uh, for that. We had, um, for the first time ever, I got almost all of the access points that I designed for um, deployed. We've had some challenges in the past uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, network resources were um, strapped a little thin because of some of the shenanigans of that other vendor that I won't name. I will say that they are the Fisher Price of network switches though, and so we, because they had so many stability problems, um, we had trouble just getting our, our access points out. But the other challenge, and this is not an uncommon event, at least in, at least in Vegas and in some other areas, um, the ho hotel infrastructure, the convention center infrastructure, it's phenomenally bad. Um, I'm, I can tell you um, that every year I go in, I pull up the floorboards, and every jack that was broken last year is still broken, and maybe some new ones are too. So it's a little bit of a challenge uh, sometimes to get um, ports to come up. Uh, and it's just, we're talking about just between the, the wall plate and the, um, and the switch port in, back in, in the IDF in the, in the closet. Um, can be a little bit challenging. Um, but in it, so in addition to the smart zone and then uh, the uh, port security that we ran um, in, on across the ICXs, and by the way, this means that I had switch um, SEs, uh, switch engineers um, on, from, from Ruckus, I had to go in and deploy um, across the three floors of the Mandalay Bay Convention Center um, into uh, more than 30 closets, including the MDF, which is down in the basement. Um, we also wired the registration area um, because we used 802.1x um, security on the registration because obviously that's where the money is going through, and we wanted to be very careful with that. In addition to that, that um, 
And this is one of the really nice things about working for Ruckus, because not only do we bring world-class Wi-Fi, and I've had just um, a really, um, I, I've been put in some challenging positions and, and, and my uh, access points have never failed me. Um, but in addition to bringing all of that to the table, when it's appropriate, we also go out and find the best partners. And for us and for Black Hat, that means our GNET. Um, and this is a company that uh, creates a, um, a device and they sit between me, uh, between uh, the LAN and the LAN. In addition to being my, uh, uh, every server that I need, the DHCP, the uh, DNS, all of that, um, they're also giving me per device VLANing. And so this is what gives us some of the, the security that it has led us, and I'm gonna say this out loud, I would appreciate it very much if you do not repeat it out loud, uh, just because I don't need any more of a target on my back. Um, but this is our third year, our fourth uh, Black Hat altogether so far completely unhacked. Um, and our GNETs can definitely take a bow to that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about their solution and how they have implemented that. Um, I just, I wanted to put this uh, sign in. So this is a sign that sat right outside the NOC, built, uh, NOC office. So when you were coming in um, to do a tour of the NOC, this is what you would see. And I just wanted to point out how much Black Hat and UBM, the, the uh, parent company for Black Hat, loves Ruckus. Um, the, the, the NOC team is, there is no such thing as pay for play. These guys um, are 100%, um, they, they go with strictly best in class. In fact, I will go you one a little bit further. The other, the Fisher Price Company uh, came out with a checkbook in order to try to get, keep their place and that was just something that they weren't going to do. Um, and so it, it is, um, 100 percent best in class. So they went with Palo Alto because there's no doubt about it. They make a, a very good uh, firewall. But both Palo Alto and RSA have been platinum sponsors for Black Hat for years because obviously this is, you know, sort of their thing. Um, Ruckus pays absolutely nothing. We don't sponsor anything. And they stuck us at the top of that sign and that was, um, I just thought that was pretty funny. They go out of their way to, to every year to uh, let us know how much they really uh, love us. So let's talk about how I got started with uh, Black Hat, because uh, again, it's one of those head scratchers. It's not the kind of thing that you know normally you would think about uh, with synonym, being synonymous with uh, Ruckus. In fact, if you were going to think of any Wi-Fi um, vendor, um, aside from Cisco, because you got to always think of Cisco because they're the 800 pound gorilla, right? Uh, but if you're thinking of a Wi-Fi company and security, the one that has sort of positioned itself front and center as being the security Wi-Fi company um, is Aruba. Um, and in fact, they were a vendor um, more than three years, uh, in, uh, in, in 2014, um, they were the Wi-Fi vendor. They did not return in 2015. Um, and if you buy me a beer sometime, I'll tell you exactly why. Um, they, uh, they, there's uh, components to their solution that does not um, does not go over well with um, with this kind of um, audience, and it's where uh, our GNETs allows us to come in with the same kind of security, but more or less in stealth mode. And so it was it, it, it allowed us to get in there. Um, in 2015, I had to, uh, run the Wi-Fi at uh, for Interop, also at the Mandalay Bay um, in, in Vegas. Uh, because I think the Mandalay Bay in Vegas is like my own version of, it's my circle of hell from Dante. Uh, I wake up and I think, oh, wow, I'm back here. It's the Dante's circle of hell meets Groundhog today. So if any of you guys have ever been to Vegas and you really like it, I apologize. It's not my favorite place. Um, but when I first started with, with uh, 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 Black Hat, they, uh, the Interop guys had uh, basically um, come back to UBM and, and let them know uh, how we had overperformed and, and over met any of their expectations. And so when Black Hat needed uh, a Wi-Fi vendor, they came, they came to us. Um, the SLA or their expectations at that point were one, Wi-Fi is a nice to have. We told, the, we told the attendees, we've been telling the attendees, there's gonna be Wi-Fi. Um, we'd really like to give them Wi-Fi since it's on the signs, we've told them that it's going to be there. Um, the first imperative is don't get hacked. Well, I thought that was a no-brainer, but it turns out to be that's not, not as easy as it sounds. Um, 
their interpretation of an awesome Wi-Fi environment was that people weren't complaining about it. That was it. They, they, if, if people don't, don't complain about it and we actually have some Wi-Fi somewhere, then that's pretty good. Um, the deployment itself, as I had mentioned, was difficult because um, the, the NOC gets built out, say, on Thursday. It goes, it's supposed to, the network is supposed to go live on Friday night. Uh, registration starts Friday. So classes start Saturday and they run Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It was either two two-day classes or one four-day class. And then Tuesday night, all of the trainings end at 6 p.m. and everything gets, to all of the training rooms, and there's about 70 of them, get switched over and become um, briefings rooms. So the first year, I had to wait for Fisher-Price Wi-Fi network to get ripped out on uh, Tuesday night to then be able to deploy the rest of the Wi-Fi. So while I had access points in the hallway, maybe, I didn't have them in necessarily all of the rooms. So it made for a challenging Tuesday night. And this is after I've already been there for five days uh, monitoring and managing the uh, the other part of the network. So it was, it was sort of a grueling in, environment. And then for the last two days, um, we needed to be providing ubiquitous coverage. So the other network would be gone entirely. Um, and this is the part that is also uh, the, one, the thing that surprises people, and it certainly it shocked me. Um, you, you're reading that last bullet point correctly. It is a PSK. So while I could argue, while a Wi-Fi engineer would argue with you that a PSK is giving you no security, um, and in fact is taking resources on from the AP and in a density environment, um, you really don't want that a, a AP being challenged more than it needs to be. So I, you could make a pretty good argument for why do we have a PSK at all? And the answer is layer eight, because it doesn't look good for a black hat security conference to be have to have an open SSID, even though we all know that the kind of people who are attending it, once there's a PSK, you've done the exact same thing. Um, you've just made it a little bit of a sport for them and that's it. Um, but again, that's more of a layer eight problem. And so um, that wasn't uh, something, that wasn't an argument I was going to win. So fast forward three years later, um, in the planning session um, that we started having uh, for, um, um, for Black Hat USA, which probably started sometime in uh, April, in the first session, the uh, CEO or the, the general manager of the Black Hat NOC team um, said, and we're going to go all wireless. So in Three short years, and really two short years, the Black Hat Knock team went from Wi-Fi is something that's nice to have to literally the quote was, we don't need wires, we have ruckus. Now the ruckus Wi-Fi engineer on the call was not thrilled with that statement because there's no Wi-Fi engineer in the world that's going to tell you that Wi-Fi is better than wired. It's, it's, we're never going to be better than wired. Um, and anything that we can put on the wire, logistically, that, that's where it should go. But the decision was made um, that where we didn't, unless we absolutely had to have wires, so the registration area, we decided to do uh, port authentication. Um, so that part was wired. And then there were a couple of training classes that physically could not use wireless. So there's the SCADA classes, the classes on uh, that have to do with how to secure your um, electric company, your electric grid, your power, your water grid, your power grid, all of that. Um, some of those devices are, uh, <laughs> thank goodness, do not have Wi-Fi um, on them at all. Um, so they, we still didn't want to get hacked, but now we're, we're having to provide not just wireless everywhere from the first day, but we're providing wireless everywhere for even the, the training classes, and those training classes push some incredible amount of data, and we'll see that in just a second. Um, the, we went from, it's nice to have, and gee, if no one complains about it, that means it's awesome, to now everything's relying on the wireless, or almost everything's relying on the wireless, and so this network has to be five by five with five nines. The reason why I, I was, able to pull this off and was not as sweating as badly as maybe I should have been is the last three bullets. First of all, we owned the network. All of my Wi-Fi, and by the way, in 2016, all of my Wi-Fi ran across 
um, brocade ICX switches as well, because I learned my lesson the first year um, because the Fisher price switches kept going down um, and it made my Wi-Fi look bad. So the second year I brought um, a bro brocade SEs and, and the brocade switches. Um, this year, we actually had the, the new Ruckus branded ICX switches, but we owned everything until the, the uh, until we hit at the north end in the uh, in the MDF the Palo Alto um, uh, firewall, and then that fed directly into two one gig links from CenturyLink, and we'll talk more about that because that's interesting too. But so we owned the network, everything wireless, everything wired was us. Um, and also because we had ubiquitous coverage from, and I said zero day, and I use that on, and I guess I know that's a, a infosec term, but I use that um, on purpose because we actually got our network up um, hours ahead of schedule. I mean, like way ahead of, almost a half a day ahead of schedule because um, it turns out it doesn't need, you don't need 20 network engineers if you have two that know what they're doing. Um, and so we were able to get the, the network up and running that quickly. But also, once again, we brought our GNETs to the table. And this is really nice because um, I, I finally get to say something nice about captive portals while also demonstrating why you bring a Wi-Fi engineer um, to a Wi-Fi network. And the reason is because anybody who's ever stayed in a hotel knows that captive portals need to die a deep, fiery death. We hate them. They don't, they either don't load, um, you, you fight them, they don't, they don't work on this browser or that browser. Um, and RGNet did something that was really rather clever, and they're not a very large company and they're very nimble, so they were able to work on this and, and, and get this up and working. Um, but the fact that they even had the idea was really uh, cool. So let me start with, in the previous years, the way the uh, Wi-Fi was handled by, uh, for the training sessions. And remember I told you there's like maybe 70 or 80 training classes going on at any given time. Um, and the Fisher Price company that did not have a Wi-Fi engineer on staff determined that since every classroom, all 70 classrooms, each of them have to be on their own VLAN because you want, for security reasons, you want all of these guys in each classroom, classroom A needs to be able to talk to everybody in the classroom probably, but we also want to make sure that they're not talking to anybody in classroom B because, let's face it, they're at a InfoSec, you know, a hackers conference. Shenanigans are going to happen, and, and they do, the, especially at Black Hat USA, it is the wild, wild west. These, People don't play nicely with each other because they're there. It's their sandbox. They're there to, to play and learn. Um, so we, they, they wanted each training classroom to be on its own VLAN. So Fisher Price decided that the way to handle that was to put an access point in every single classroom. And as much as Ruckus grimaces and makes faces over putting a single access point in every single school classroom or university classroom. Just imagine doing this in a training classroom at a convention center, because these walls are not made out of cinder block or brick. They are made out of paper mache. These are just the air gap, you know, pretend walls that they uh, fold in and fold out when uh, they need to change up the, um, the, the structure of the, of the room. So there's no um, RF attenuation going on. So now they've got not just the Cisco microcells that are the hotel infrastructure, the, the convention center infrastructure at the Mandalay Bay. Now they've also stuck their, what turns out to be really crappy um, radios, their access points, but they're doing, seven, they're doing one in each classroom. And each classroom is broadcasting its own SSID. So I can't think of a way they could have made this worse except for that sometimes they stuck the access points in the floorboards in the, you know, the steel metal Faraday cages where the, um, the electric plugs are. And I know you guys think I'm making this up, but I, I'm honest to goodness, I, I, I'm not. And they couldn't have done a better job of making me look good um, in comparison. So they're broadcasting an SSID for every classroom. Each SSID has its own VLAN. They've got access points in every single classroom. The RF environment is virtually unusable. And I know that because I've, I, I would do over the air scanning, I'd do some cap, packet captures and look to see what was going on. And it was an absolute nightmare. I can also now completely vouch for the fact that 
uh, RF and Wi-Fi poses no health risks because if so, 18,000 men would not be having children um, after having been what, uh, through what uh, the Fisher Price uh, people had put them through. So here's what we did. We, we, once all of that mess was gone and this year we owned the, the network, we said, let's, let's put the access points where they belong. We're going to put them where they belong in terms of coverage, in terms of density, and that's certainly not one in every classroom. So without regard to which classroom was which, we, we did, I designed because I, I'm now, heaven help me, very familiar with the layout of the Mandalay Bay Convention Center. So I can almost go in blindfolded and, and lay out the access points. Um, but uh, once we got that done, um, we turned to our GNETs and they, they had the brilliant idea. So they created a captive portal. So the landing page would pop up. We, we broadcast one SSID, the, whatever the training SSID name was. Everybody lo uh, logged into that same SSID. They were given a captive portal and we had sneaker netted passphrases along, out to each classroom. So every classroom, and if you came into classroom A, you put in your passphrase and that automatically VLAN you off into classroom A's for as long as classroom A, if it was a two-day class or a four-day class. But since that SSID was being broadcast on absolutely all of the access points, it meant that if you left the classroom to go have coffee, which was way down the hall, or lunch, you could continue working and hit all of the resources that your classroom was using because you were still on the same VLAN and would be until the end of training. And so this was really great, and this is something that our GNEX did for us, and it went over very well. So let's talk about some of the, the challenges with uh, Wi-Fi. Um, in terms of, and this goes beyond what a regular conference. If you go, to, if you needed to set up uh, the network for uh, just a regular tech conference, there, there are some good and some bad things. There's, there's density. There's, there's all the usual suspects about how you're going to deal with things. There are some ironically uh, not security-related challenges um, around Black Hat because so many people are paranoid. There's actually less of an uptake in, outside of the training classes. People don't get on the network as much as they would if they were at just a regular teacher's conference or music event or even a tech conference. Uh, but because they're paranoid, they're also bringing their burner devices. So these are devices that they don't use in their day-to-day -day world. In fact, they may only bring them out once a year at Black Hat. And that means, ironically, I see more legacy devices at Black Hat than I see anywhere else. And so this is a little bit of a challenge because uh, while I still have been able to uh, do OFDM only, I can't go strictly to um, uh, 5 gig only, which is something I would dearly love to be able to do. Um, interestingly enough, and this happened um, last year, um, there was a uh, the first year in 2015, I saw um, most of the mobile devices were Androids um, and by, say, two to one. Um, there were a lot fewer Apple devices. Um, in 2016, uh, Black Hat happened in July, and just a few months before, there had been a big brouhaha, some of you may uh, be aware of this, with, between the FBI and Apple in terms of being able to uh, write code that would uh, break the security of uh, an Apple iPhone that had been used by somebody who had committed an act of domestic terrorism. And Apple refused to do it. The FBI said, okay, never mind. We figured out how to do it ourselves. And all of a sudden, within just a few short months, um, Apple devices became hugely popular, and they, they flipped um, in terms of numbers of the devices that I was seeing on the network, and you're seeing a lot more classes in terms of penetration testing and things like that around iOS devices as well. Um, I always see at least seven um, uh, uh, BlackBerry devices, and those are, and I know exactly where they are because they're on the access point that's over by the um, by the FBI's booth, and so I always, you know, stop by and say hi to those those guys. We have the um, the pineapples, but Forget about that. This year, we also had um, aerial drones um, that had access points on them. And then this device that uh, we found in a planter. So this is actually a 3D printed battery case. Why? I do not know. Um, because some guys spent some time, uh, and this is just a regular uh, uh, Wi-Fi card, generic Wi-Fi card 
Um, so this is just a sniffer, but he, he built this, I guess, in his mother's basement and brought it to Black Hat and threw them in uh, the couple of planters. But what's missing of the problems that we saw is very interesting. I, ha did, I have seen zero spoofed SSIDs. Do I see a lot of SSIDs out there that everybody's broadcasting? And, and, and in, uh, at Black Hat USA, a lot of the SSID names are um, not safe for work. Um, they're, <laughs> I told you it's the wild, wild west. So there's a lot of uh, hundreds and hundreds of radios. But I don't see anybody trying to spoof my SSIDs. We saw only one uh, wireless denial of service attack that we, that we thought, and it turned out to be um, uh, user error on the part of a UBM um, marketing guy. Um, so we, didn't, we haven't seen any of that. So as much as we see a lot of weirdness, um, we're not on the Wi-Fi side. I haven't, um, I haven't had nearly the problems that you would think. I do have this guy running around periodically. And so forget a pineapple. This is the cactus, um, uh, the Wi-Fi cactus. And this is 50 pineapples that he has um, done some custom JSON um, uh, code for so that he can walk around and scan. He's, this is just scanning. He's not doing anything bad, but he can capture all of the data. And, and even if you're doing channel uh, hopping, he is able to, to stitch all of that together. Uh, and that, by the way, is on a, a, a shoulder harness. So this is a big backpack. Um, the dollar value of the hardware that we're looking at is probably enough that he could have afforded a down payment on a house, but uh, everybody has to have their hobby, right? Um, so this slide, this is a graphic of some of the, of the threats that we saw on a daily basis coming from, um, and this is through the RGNets interface. Um, the blue is the emerging threats. Um, gray were actual attacks. Um, the green here at the bottom, and I'm, most, I'm very proud of this, and we'll talk a little bit about this in an, uh, in an upcoming slide. That's more than 20,000 connections. Um, and I want to point out that the first day of, was the big blue. That's Saturday of the first day of training. So we have Saturday and Sunday. And then the last two days where everything drops off, this is where the briefings happen. So a lot of these uh, emerging threats and attacks are happening specifically during training times and are actually legitimate, um, well, legitimately illegitimate uh, work. This is, this is involved, uh, involved with the training uh, that, that's going on. Um, the emerging threats is more interesting because these, is, these are domains that were set up probably specifically for training and never been seen before. Um, and so they're obviously uh, in, involved with the, the, the trainers that set those up for that. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, uh, just a still shot of a video that I did for just for my iPhone. Um, this is one of the screens that stays up at the NOC um, that you can come in and see. This is OIP. Um, it's just a visual display of some of the traffic that we're seeing. So the um, green dots are TCP, the red is UDP, and the white is ICMP. Um, and that was, um, and, and the size of the blobs have to do with the, they're relative to the size of the packets. What you can't see very well is that almost all, well, all of the traffic is coming from my wireless clients, and they're mostly being lobbed straight at our gateways. Um, and so, and again, most of this is, is uh, just uh, passively sniffing at stuff um, and not really um, being malicious. So uh, let's talk about the results because it really doesn't matter um, uh, if you have good security, if you're wired and your wireless networks aren't stable. Um, our network went up, I told you, um, hours ahead of time and we had 100% uptime. We had absolutely no outages. Um, so our network went up on Friday. Um, the training started on Saturday morning, and we were pushing more than two terabytes every single day. Um, the throughput spikes for the trainings were in the morning, so people would come in, and a lot of times, um, just to give you an idea of some of the challenges, so we're pushing a lot of data through, throughout the day, but it's spiking in the morning, so we're really stressing the network every single morning because these guys are a lot of times downloading um, VMs um, from the teacher resources from the servers. And in some cases, well, in a lot of cases, these are VMs that are being downloaded across VPNs. And in some cases, those servers are located nowhere near um, Vegas and across some iffy links. I'm talking to you, Australia. 
Um, um, and so that, that there were some, some real challenges. So it, 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 it's not enough that you give them solid Wi-Fi and a solid throughput above that. You have to deal with um, what they're connecting to on the other side. The, in red and in bold is something I'm very proud of because this has happened in the history of Black Hat never until this year, until this year when Ruckus owned the entire network. They have always had a single, uh, uh, two one gig um, links that CenturyLink runs in that they, that they load balance across twice um, on in the mornings of, um, I believe it was Sunday and Monday morning, we hit the capacity. We actually ran into performance problems because we were exceeding the two gig backhaul uh, pipe that we had. Um, and so because of that, Black Hat is actually um, going to be switching to a 10 gig uh, backhaul for next year. And the truth is they've never ha hit that um, cap before, not because the demand wasn't there, because we all know if you give them the uh, bandwidth, they will use it. Um, it's because the network was never stable. In fact, last year on uh, Sunday night, the Fisher Price Company did a firmware upgrade something that all of us should just go weak in the knees at the idea of doing in the middle of a conference. It did not go well, and they did a firmware rollback Monday morning just as classes were starting. And you can imagine if classes are starting and you're expecting to push two terabytes that day and the network is has rolling outages for the first four hours of the morning, um, just how badly things were going. In fact, I can guarantee, I can tell you quite honestly, there was vodka involved by three o'clock in the afternoon. Not for me, because my stuff was up, but there were some people who were having some trouble uh, dealing with reality that day. Um, but so the training sessions were pushing that much data, the spikes are in the morning, but remember the training classes, I have some 70 to 80 training classrooms. Now, because I'm a Wi-Fi engineer, I don't have 70 or 80 access points that are supporting those, but I probably have, 30 to 40, because some of the APs are in the hallways doing double duty, um, that are taking that load um, for me. And so they're spread across in the trainings, uh, during the training sessions, I probably didn't have, I never had more than 80 clients on, on any single access point, not just any single radio, just any single access point, uh, because I had them um, uh, spread so nicely. Um, in the briefing sessions, now the one thing that saves me on this is that there's a lot less of an uptake. Even though there's a lot more people, um, the people who were uh, using the network for trainings are now no longer using them, and um, the people who are coming in are only sporadically using it. So I, the number of users stayed about the same. I never had more than 3,000 users um, at any given time. Uh, even though we had 18,000 uh, attendees. So you can, uh, you, that's what I'm saying about the uptake rate. You can usually at a conference account uh, assume about maybe a 40% uptake rate, depending on where you are. If it's a younger group um, and it's a highly, you know, if it's a, if it's a Twitch conference, I, I would imagine it'd be much higher rate. Um, and for uh, the uptake rate to be that low is actually one of the nice things because um, it, it uh, it, it sort of gives us some breathing room. But even though I still only, I only had 2,000 people, the spike at um, the briefing session is at lunchtime because during the briefings, they're not really on the network, they're paying attention to the presentations. When they're in the business hall, they're walking around talking to the people at the booths and getting their swag and things like that. When they're at lunch is when they catch up on everything and remember those 18,000 attendees? If they're all in there having lunch and I've got 2,000 people, even though I've only got 2,000 people, I have 18,000 blobs of water that are causing RF interference. And in the um, uh, lunch rooms, I probably only had at most eight access points because they've, they've got everybody in such a condensed area. It's like trying to cover a keynote area. Um, in terms of the challenge. And so in terms of design, that's also something that has to be taken into uh, consideration. Okay, so the last little bit is just to get in some sexy quotes because, and this is probably my favorite part um, of this, um, for the first time in years, it turns out UVM has a VIP party um, every Tuesday night. Remember what I told you Tuesday nights were like before this year? Um, it's the night that we have to pull out the Fisher Price stuff and throw in like 60 more ruckus things to make sure that everything comes up. 
Um, this year, we were all out of the NOC by 6 p.m. and every one of the, not me, because I went to bed, I'm a big girl, um, but the rest of the NOC team got to go to the VIP party. I understand there was a lot of tequila involved. I'm really glad I missed it. But they all got to go to the party for the first time and, and they were pretty happy. And because of that, we got a lot of, uh, of uh, comments like the ones that you see up here. Um, and the Mandalay Bay IT team lead, his name is Doc. He has never spoken to me. He came up and clapped me on the back and thanked us for, um, he got to go home and go to sleep at some point during the, um, the network too. Uh, but also we got um, uh, these quotes and these are from the actual Black Hat um, uh, NOC team. And um, and so they have they have definitely uh, uh, shown us some love. I did want to point out that I did I have never been able to do this on my own. I'm the Wi-Fi engineer and the, and the main designer for it. Um, Eric is a uh, the local SE, just unfortunate enough to live in Vegas, and so he has to come out every year. And then Jason and Matt are both SEs from the professional services team um, from. Uh, 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 actually both coasts and so they came out to Vegas and um, and switched out and and uh, and helped me out I will be in uh, uh, in London um, and that's a much smaller show so it'll it'll be me and uh, Simona from our TME team and if you guys have seen the recent bake-off that we uh, gave out with the performance of the r610 um, in comparison to, oh, everyone else who fell down as soon as you put video across the AP. Um, she is the team lead for, um, the, the director for that team. Um, and, um, and so she's going to be in London. Um, if any of you guys want to come out to uh, see us in Singapore next year, we will be there in March and I'd be happy to see you. And then with that, I have actually powered through, maybe I had a little too much caffeine, um, I have powered through my hour presentation in 48 minutes, leaving plenty of time for anybody who wants to ask me any questions. Uh, not to put the pressure on you, but yes, there's the pressure. And I'm going to start calling out names. Carl's going to absolutely have to ask a question if he hasn't dropped already. I guess he did. Ah, now I get to make fun of him for doing that. It's because I said something about Australia. That's why he dropped. And Zoe, are you seeing any questions? Uh, not, seems not. They are all good. I no. didn't see any uh, okay. questions. I didn't my, expect any. Really. I I, you know what, it's because it's morning for you guys, you needed to have some extra, an extra cup of tea or a cup of coffee. And the ideas are relatively new to the audience, I believe, yeah. This is the first time we hear about it for the partners. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we, we may have to do it again, huh? Um, I always like to hear something yeah. two or three times. Yeah, I just saw some well, feedbacks, uh, thanks, we don't have questions and great sharing. This is uh, okay. yeah, what I saw in the Q&A, yep. So with this, uh, maybe we can um, wrap it up and then we appreciate for any questions after um, the call and feel free to send us email and we'll be sharing the recording and the deck. Right. Yes, I'll get the, I'll get the deck out. Um, I I will be uh, writing a blog um, about this uh, coming up. I just frankly haven't had uh, any time. Um, if you uh, guys may have known uh, noticed, we had a little bit of weather problems out here in the U.S. And so I've been uh, working with a group. Records has been uh, instrumental in uh, working with a group that goes in, uh, IT professionals go in and rebuild networks for schools and communities and also disaster relief centers. And so we've been uh, a little distracted by that. But I'll be doing the uh, a blog for that. And uh, as well, if anybody has any questions you just want to ask me, I'll find. Um, everybody at Ruckus is first dot last name at ruckuswireless.com. You can email me. I am heather.williams at ruckuswireless.com. And in fact, if you're still online, I'm going to go ahead and just enter that in, into the chat session so that you have that. I have had people who just did, really didn't want to ask a question um, during the session or didn't think about it until right after I hung up. 
um, and I'm very happy to um, answer questions at any time. Okay, thank you very much, Heather, and thank you very want to join the webinar. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll see you guys next time in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.